So my name is Li Ming Tsai, and currently I am a professor at the Tongji University, Shanghai. And uh, today it's my great honor uh, to introduce Professor Pitch as our guest speaker uh, for today's uh, conversing webinar. And uh, Professor Pitch has been the director of the Institute for Conversing Technology at the RWTH Aachen University since 2010. Uh, his main research interests are in the fields of conversing theory, uh, conversing chemistry, turbulence, multiphase flows, with application to technical conversing systems. Uh, he has published over 200 papers in refer refereed journals, I guess a lot with me together. Uh, he is a fellow of the International Conversing Institute and the American Physical Society. Uh, he has received the uh, prestigious uh, advanced research grant, uh, ERC at a research grant. And uh, for the recent uh, 37th International Symposium on Conversing, he served as the one of the two co-chairs. And I guess uh, Professor Pitch does not really need a, an introduction. And he is well known for his contribution in the conversing community, which is also evidenced by the large number of the audience today. And uh, so uh, the floor is yours, Professor Pitt. Okay, so um, uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Thanks uh, to the organizers for uh, inviting me uh, to give this lecture. Um, I'm happy to be here and I welcome all of you uh, to, my, uh, to my home here. Um, I hope everyone is doing well in these um, difficult times and uh, I hope to see uh, all of you soon. Uh, again in person. So um, it is quite some time back that I agreed to uh, give this lecture. It was moved uh, once or twice for, for various reasons. Um, but uh, I hadn't decided on a, on a topic until very recently, I think only two weeks ago, uh, when Isaac reminded me again of this. I thought about what's, uh, what's a good topic. And I think hydrogen is a topic that everyone talks about um, now. It is becoming re very relevant. So, um, so that's the, the topic today. Um, hydrogen uh, combustion chemistry has, has typically has nine species uh, in a mechanism. So it seems very simple, but I wanna uh, give you an impression today that it's not as simple as it sometimes seems. Um, thanks here to the uh, people in my group and all, all former members of my group uh, here who are listed here on the bottom who contributed to this talk, uh, some of the work to this talk. Uh, special thanks here to Lukas Berger, who um, helped me put uh, this talk together on really on short notice. As I said, we decided only um, uh, uh, two weeks ago. So I don't want to motivate hydrogen, really. Um, everyone knows uh, why hydrogen is important now. Um, we live in a time where we need to do something about the way we uh, deal with energy. Um, we want to transition to uh, use uh, renewable energy forms without CO2 emissions. And um, renewable energies are, are volatile. They are uh, very intermittent, um, especially uh, sun and wind, which are the two main uh, sources of, of um, renewable energy are, uh, are very intermittent. And so one needs um, energy storage. And uh, it's very well known that uh, energy storage for two reasons, first of all, to um, move um, to move uh, energy around uh, uh, to transport energy from places that have a lot of renewable energy to other places that don't, uh, but also in time, maybe maybe in the summer for the winter and so on. So um, it, it's also well known that chemical energy carriers are are, are very well suited uh, to do this because of high energy density and so on. And, um, and, and hydrogen is one of these uh, then so-called e-fuels. Uh, so that's a, a, a good promising candidate, especially since it has no carbon in it, um, but there are a lot of challenges. And I wanna talk about this a little bit. Um, if we think about combustion as um, combustion devices uh, as a joint optimization problem, where we typically try to optimize efficiency, stability, um, and emissions at the same time where safety issues here uh, are part of stability in this picture. And, and of course, cost uh, is important, it hovers uh, above all of these, but um, 
then there's typically a, a conflict of objectives. Um, so for example, uh, high temperature is typically good for high efficiency, but, but bad for, for emissions. And um, lean combustion is usually good for uh, low emissions, but is, is bad for stability. And so, um, uh, you know, trying to optimize all of this at the same time, um, hydrogen actually gives some opportunities. Uh, hydrogen has very high flame speed, long ignition delay times, which, for example, in internal combustion engines is very good for uh, efficiency. Um, uh, hydrogen has no uh, carbon, so there's no CO2, no soot, no unburned hydrocarbons, no CO. Uh, these are all pollutants that we worry about um, uh, a lot, and, and greenhouse gases that we worry about a lot. Uh, here, we don't need to worry about this for hydrogen um, uh, in particular. So we need to worry about only maybe about NOx. And uh, if you have to worry about only one uh, pollutant, it, it might make life a lot easier. Um, and then uh, stability uh, is an issue, for example, for lean burn, ultra lean burn uh, is good for emissions, good for efficiency, but um, uh, stability there is an issue and high flame speeds of, of, um, of um, uh, hydrogen uh, help uh, in, in the stability there. Their challenge is also uh, the high flame speeds that, that might help for stability. And in one case, they lead to flashback. In another case, high adiabatic flame temperatures um, might lead to um, uh, NOx emissions, higher NOx emissions. Safety is a concern. And, and a particular concern here is, and I want to make this point later, uh, is that combustion of, of um, hydrogen is very, very complex. And because we don't have any models, uh, predictive models at this time, um, for all of these regimes that we're looking at, um, uh, computational design is actually, um, uh, is actually um, difficult. So this shows, um, this graph here shows very briefly, uh, it shows to what extent, what amount of uh, hydrogen I can actually um, uh, operate a device without doing further research here in blue. And you see that most of these devices here, gas turbine, vehicle, vehicle engines, and so on, uh, they cannot go to um, uh, hydrogen fractions of, of more than 50%. Uh, without, without um, you know, the need to do further research first. So, so what are the, um, uh, the, the differences in hydrogen that make this so difficult? Uh, we want to look at the fuel properties for a minute. So let's start here with the energy content. Um, uh, this here shows the, the lower heating value. And you see um, hydrogen has very high specific energy. Actually, it's the, the highest uh, of the chemicals um, but the problem is it's gaseous and uh, gaseous uh, uh, fuels have, um, have low energy density. So you see that energy density here is even much, much less, a third only of methane. Uh, and, and here, you know, the, for isooctane, it would be about uh, uh, 3,000 times higher. So there are different ways to uh, storage, then is a big, big challenge. There are different ways to store. Um, hydrogen, for example, uh, making it very cold, cryogenic. Uh, but the, the issue here, you see the, 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 the boiling point is very, very low, 20 Kelvin here at one bar. Uh, and even then, uh, the density of liquid hydrogen is, is also very low. It's about a factor of 10 lower than what you get from a typical uh, liquid fuel. Uh, so that's, that's also not good. High pressure is a little better, uh, pressurized hydrogen. Uh, would be carried uh, for mobility at about 700 bar, um, which gives you then an energy density of about 7,000 megajoule per cubic meter, which is still only a quarter of what you have for, uh, for other liquid fuels, but at least in this, it's in the same order of magnitude. We look at combustion properties. Oh, no, let me, uh, let me say this first. Because of this low um, energy density, the, the volume of the fuel also makes a big um, impact on the volume of a fuel mixture, which, which, which often can be neglected. Uh, so that's an issue that, that also becomes important. Um, looking at the combustion properties, um, we see that um, hydrogen has high uh, adiabatic flame temperature. I mentioned this, that might lead to high NOx, high um, RON, and, and auto ignition temperature, which might be good uh, in engines, 
uh, but it also has wide flammability limits. That's a concern for safety. And then the Lewis number has very high diffusivity, low Lewis number. And that um, I'll come back to uh, later on when I talk about instabilities. So the impact is that, for example, for gas turbines, uh, the, the fuel flow rate is three times higher than for a natural gas. So the fuel system needs, needs to be uh, modified. Internal combustion engines, um, uh, because, because the fuel air mixture also has a higher volume, uh, it, it might be difficult to get to high loads. Um, but uh, so, so maybe by boosting the engine, one can go to higher loads. But that, again, might lead to um, difficulties with, with a pre-ignition pre or not. Um, on the other hand, uh, high compression ratios could give very high efficiencies um, and so on. So looking at uh, this in a little more detail, uh, this shows here the minimum ignition energy for, for hydrogen here. Uh, and then here for, for N-heptane and methane. And you see that the, the, the minimum um, ignition energy here uh, for different equivalence ratios, for even for stoichiometric, uh, or let's say for different equivalence ratios, is, is almost a factor of 10 uh, lower than for these other fuels, or maybe even more. Another, um, um, uh, another point that is very important, uh, I mentioned um, hydrogen has high quoted run numbers, which is good for an, for an internal combustion engine, but um, it's susceptible to pre-ignition on hot surfaces. And that's characterized here by this um, pre-ignition resistance number, um, which, which for uh, hydrogen is not very good. You see here that this correlates actually with a laminar burning velocity. Um, high burning velocity gives low pre-ignition resistance. Uh, and that's, a, that's an issue in engines, for example, and also in burners for, on hot surfaces. Um, and I want to show you an example for this. This is a, this is a little test that we did in our lab. Um, we looked at this domestic water heater. Uh, you have here a, a burner, a cylindrical burner. Fuel air uh, is, is um, brought into this burner from the inside. And then it leaves this burner through a, this perforated um, surface. And then you have a flame that burns around this. I'll show this later on. And then you have a heat exchanger here on the outside. We, we took out uh, here this, um, this burner. We covered most of it because actually this thing we use in class to just show you know, how these things work, how these things burn. Um, and, um, but here we put it in the lab and we run it with methane and we add hydrogen. And you see here the fraction of hydrogen, which is 70, 80%, 90%. It goes even higher, and you will see when we um, approach 95, 96%, there will be a change. Uh, we're approaching now 95, and bam, you get you get flashback. You didn't see this here, but um, uh, this is uh, this is how this looks like. Okay, and why? Because the high burning velocity makes this burn closer to the burner, which makes the surface glow, and then on the inside, um, you actually get surface ignition which leads to, then to this uh, flashback uh, phenomenon. I mentioned higher um, adiabatic flame temperatures. Does that lead to higher NOx? Um, well, yes. In fact, a lot of uh, studies have reported higher NOx uh, emissions uh, for hydrogen. Um, but here I want to show you an example where you get exactly the, the opposite. Um, I'm, I'm starting here again with the same um, uh, domestic water heater. You see it burning now. We run this in our lab. We have done uh, temperature and also species measurements inside this burner. And to make the whole thing a little easier, also easier to compute, we um, uh, looked at a um, flat plate, um, a perforated plate burner, uh, uh, you know, using using same fuel and, and uh, conditions otherwise. And we measured uh, what happens here downstream. And uh, you see here for when this is operated with methane, you see here the NO um, mole fraction as function of the, the distance from the burner. Uh, and you see here the same for hydrogen enriched condition. And you see we get less um, NOx for the hydrogen enriched condition than for uh, methane. Why is that? This is because, um, let's first look at the temperature. This is the temperature uh, for the hydrogen enriched, this for methane, and it turns out the temperature is almost the same. Why is that? Because the higher burning velocity makes this burn faster to the uh, closer to the burner and the burner. Um, so you have more heat losses to the burner, which is actually desired in these types of burners 
to, to have heat losses to the burner, which then glows and has um, radiative uh, heat transfer uh, to the heat exchanger. And, and then the combustion temperature is lower, which gives you less NOx. So first of all, the temperature is, is relatively low here, it's not higher than for methane because of this heat loss effect. And then secondly, that's something I thought was very interesting. Many, probably many of you know this, but um, we looked at what happens in these burners when we run them very lean, so lean that, um, that thermal NOx uh, becomes almost insignificant. Then what forms NOx is prompt NO. Even though it's very lean, it's prompt NO uh, that, that forms NOx. And, and it just turns out that if you add hydrogen, then you get less CH radical and then also less uh, a prompt NO. So that's, uh, that's, it. that's the reason really why you get less NOx. Okay, then uh, the other big difference, I mentioned this a few times now, is the flame speed. Uh, you see here a measurement for flame speed uh, left uh, for, for um, methane air, on the right for hydrogen air. Conditions here are almost the same. Hydrogen air here is a little higher pressure, which means it should actually be slower. Uh, they, they run on the same time scale here, and you see hydrogen is so much faster than, uh, than um, uh, the methane flame that you can hardly see what happens here, the, the methane flame moving. Um, why is that? Um, there are several different reasons why that is, and I want to discuss these in the, um, uh, in the following. The first is that even the unstretched laminar burning velocity of hydrogen is much higher than for methane, but the, and, that, and that, is, that is well known. The second, though, is that um, here, these, uh, these um, spherical flames, they are stretched. And um, if you have stretch, you have Markstein effects. And Markstein effects can make the flame faster or they can make them slower. And it turns out for these hydrogen flames, the Markstein effects here make the, the flame even faster. That's the second effect. And the third is, you see this also here, is that you get these um, flame instabilities that, uh, that start uh, just after the um, uh, ignition, a little bit after the ignition, uh, and these make the flame uh, substantially faster. And I'll talk about this um, in a minute. So um, let's talk about these three effects. First, the unstretched burning velocity. How do we measure this? Uh, you have seen this on the previous slide. This is the setup we have in our lab. We have a spherical uh, combustion chamber that's filled with a fuel air mixture, the electrodes in the center, um, a spark, and then you see this, uh, you see the spherical flame. Uh, we measure here the uh, radius as function of time of the spherical flame. We can convert this here to stretch. Ignition happens here. And then you see here, this is the, this is the, 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 the flame speed uh, that we see. And you see when the flame gets larger, actually because of the stretch, also here the, the flame gets uh, faster. And then we extrapolate, this is what we measure. We extrapolate that then to zero stretch, and that's how we measure the burning velocity. Now, if we do that also for hydrogen, uh, this is what you get. You see here methane here on the bottom. Uh, this is hydrogen air at, at one atmosphere, um, uh, um, uh, 300 Kelvin, 298 Kelvin. And you see it's um, even at uh, stoichiometric conditions is five or six times higher than methane air. Um, and, and here for rich conditions and also for lean conditions, even much, much higher. So the burning velocity of hydrogen air uh, is just, the unstretched burning velocity um, is just um, very, very high, okay? So that's one, and, and what, what are the opportunities and risk of this? I've talked about this earlier. But let's look at this a little more and look at the, the second effect I mentioned earlier, the Markstein effects. You see here that the, um, uh, the uh, the, the methane flame in the beginning has relatively low burning velocity, while the, the, the spherical flame grows, the, um, the burning velocity gets, gets larger and larger. Uh, this is uh, expressed here uh, with this uh, uh, expression. This is the burning velocity, is then the unstretched burning velocity here, minus the stretch effects. And um, you see that this, uh, the stretch comes from curvature, and uh, strain and the, um, the um, sensitivity here, let's say, of the burning velocity to the stretch effects, we call this the Markstein number. So the Markstein number is nothing else than, th than this slope here or the negative value of this slope. 
uh, that expresses the um, uh, that expresses the the, the sensitivity to uh, curvature and and strain. And if we look at this at this uh, for for hydrogen, then we see the ignition is here, and then you see here this this uh, slope has the exact opposite sign here. While the, the, the spherical flame gets larger, the flame gets slower and slower. So the fastest is here for the high, very highest uh, stretch values. And that corresponds then to a negative uh, Markstein length, and um, which means then the um, flame speed increases with, with stretch and that, that gets uh, more important later on. Um, the other thing you see here is that this goes down, is almost linear behavior, or it looks pretty linear, uh, actually, this behavior. And then you see this starts going up here again. And we want to look at this um, effect here a little more closely. Um, uh, this is a different case where we see where you see this a little better. Again, here, this is the ignition uh, point. And, uh, you know, first, the kernel is very small, high stretch, and then the kernel grows. You see here, again, a slightly negative Markstein number here, almost doesn't change. But then once you reach a certain radius here, we call this the critical radius, the, fl the apparent flame speed here increases very drastically. And that is because the instabilities you see here on the, um, uh, on the flame surface. Okay, and this instability, of course, it also it creates increases the flame surface, and it also makes the apparent flame speed larger. And you see here, this is again the, the unstretched burning velocity. And this one here is the one with the instability. And you see, if we go here, even um, if we go here to the uh, 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 stoichiometric or even lean values, this keeps increasing because the instability gets, um, gets stronger and stronger. Okay, so the instabilities are very important. Um, why do we get these instabilities? What causes these and, and what's the effect? That's what I want to talk about um, uh, a little more on the following slide. So first of all, there are two different kinds of instabilities. Um, um, we, we distinguish here the hydrodynamic instability, or we call this also the Dareos-Landau instability, DL instability. Uh, and the second here is the thermodiffusive instability. The hydrodynamic instability has nothing to do with the Lewis number. Uh, it, it's just um, uh, caused by the, by the effect of a moving uh, flame front, uh, which has a density jump. You see here, this, uh, let's say this orange line here is a, is a planar flame. And um, you have a flow that goes here from the bottom to the top. And that flame burns from the top into that uh, incoming uh, fuel stream. Then let's say we have a little perturbation here, which is then the red line. Um, you see that the, um, because of this angle uh, of, of the flame, the streamlines are deflected because of the deflection of the streamlines uh, that is caused by the heat release across the flame. Um, this region here is decelerated a little bit. These regions here are accelerated a little bit which pushes then in this region, the flame downstream. In this region here, because it's decelerated, the flame can burn into this decelerated region. And, and that makes the initial perturbation stronger and that leads to an instability. Uh, that's the hydrodynamic instability. Again, nothing to do with diffusion. And that's a, always the destabilizing effect. That, that's always there, uh, especially when the flame is very thin. Um, 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 so, um, um, right, and then and then we have the thermodiffusive instability that comes by, um, as the name suggests, diffusion effects. For hydrogen here, the Lewis number is very low, or the mass diffusivity is much larger than the than the uh, uh, thermal diffusivity, or much larger also than the diffusivity of the oxygen, uh, which is important. This causes differential diffusion effects between these two. It leads locally to lean mixtures and rich mixtures because oxygen and, and hydrogen diffuse differently. And that leads then to um, uh, the formation of these cellular structures. And you see this here um, uh, from experiments, how you form uh, these, uh, these uh, cellular structures. This shows the mechanisms in a little more detail. Uh, again, we can start here with this uh, simple um, relation where for, um, where for uh, uh, hydrogen, then we can look here at the Markstein length. This is the Markstein length here from, uh, from a very no well-known classical theory. 
Um, and you see here the first term that is just um, gamma here is the density ratio that's just um, uh, the the term that relates to the hydrodynamic instability and then this term here has the Lewis number Lewis minus one so you see for small Lewis number uh, this term be can become negative if it's negative uh, and if it's negative enough the whole thing becomes negative which then leads to a negative maximum that's the fact for hydrogen if this maximum number is negative you see you have another minus here, then for positive stretch, uh, this term here becomes positive and will make the, um, uh, for positive curvature, will make the um, flame speed larger. And then again, we can start here uh, looking at an uh, almost flat flame surface with a small perturbation or take this one here, then um, this here is positive curvature. Positive curvature then leads to an for hydrogen, an increase in the in the burning velocity. So here it will burn faster. Here is negative uh, curvature, which means the, the burning velocity, because of the Markson effect, will get smaller than the unstretched value. And so here it burns even slower. That makes the, um, the amplitude here of this uh, perturbation larger. And, and again, that is an instability. So, so that's what happens for the thermodiffusive instability. Really, if you want to think about what happens here physically, um, you see that uh, in a region like this, hydrogen hydrogen comes from here, diffuses into the flame. Uh, oxygen also diffuses into the flame. But because hydrogen diffuses faster in a region like this, you see that the hydrogen diffusive fluxes, they concentrate on one point and they will locally lead to a more rich mixture, which then burns faster. And then uh, in a region like this, the um, hydrogen it has to it has to you know fill in a larger region um, and and so it will lead to lower equivalence ratio and a lower flame speed and so uh, this is why these regions here become slower and slower uh, and slower. Okay, so these instabilities they are very important for laminar flames and also for turbulent flames and I will focus here first on the laminar flames and then. I will uh, talk about um, turbulent flames um, afterwards. So I mentioned at the beginning, there's a critical radius at which these flames become unstable. And we um, analyzed uh, the critical radius um, here based on, uh, on uh, some of the work by Moshe Matalon. Uh, it's described uh, here in this paper by Joachim Beekman. Uh, together with the theory and the um, uh, and also experiments. So so this is um, this is the expression here uh, from theory that sh that shows you the growth rate of the surface, um, you know, as function of different parameters. And you see here the first term that's the hydrodynamic instability. The second term that's the thermodiffusive part. Omega here is written here has different contributions. Has the effective Lewis number which is given here. Um, or the reduced Lewis number, which depends here on this effective Lewis number, Zeldovich number, and so on. And, and this, this um, relation here has two important aspects. Um, the first aspect it shows is that, again, um, the hydrodynamic and the thermodiffusive effect, they always come together and they interact with each other. That's, that's important. And the second one is that, um, that the growth rate here depends on different parameters, for example, um, the the, di the diameter or the radius of the of the spherical flame, the wave number, and also the um, effective Lewis number. And if we just plot here, if we plot the growth rate as function of the radius of the of the flame for certain conditions, we see the red as function here of the of the wavelength. Then we see that um, here for large radius. Um, a, a very large range here of the, of, the, of the wavelength is unstable, but for smaller radius, um, you know, closer to the, to the beginning after ignition, um, uh, only a small range here of wave numbers becomes unstable. And if we make the radius even smaller uh, in the very beginning, then you see there's a critical um, radius at which all wave numbers are stable. So, so the, the diffusive effect actually the thermodiffusive effect actually it becomes stabilizing and so we can we can then uh, from this uh, first of all for for each radius we can we can um, define here the range of unstable wave numbers 
uh, from this, um, uh, this, this um, regime diagram is constructed, but also we can determine the critical uh, radius, uh, which is shown here from theory as function of pressure, uh, and here from, from, the, um, uh, from the experiments uh, that we did in our lab. And what you see here is um, the experiment is much higher than the, the theory, or let's say it's higher than the theory. But the, the, the range here, or, or the, 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 the dependence on the pressure is very well captured uh, um, by the theory. And so we, we um, did the experiments for, for many different conditions, and then we, uh, we obtained the um, critical radius, and we fitted this here so we can use this fit to determine, um, you know, what is the critical radius at, at different given conditions. Okay, so that's the critical radius. Once we are above the critical radius, um, the flame can become unstable, and now we want to see, um, you know, what is the, what is the growth rate uh, of this for a planar uh, flame. And so to do this, um, so we want to look at the linear regime first. To do this, we start here, we do simulations uh, here shown at equivalence ratio of 0.4. Um, we start with a flat flame that burns here towards an inlet. Uh, there's a flow that goes, comes here from the top to, to the top, uh, from the bottom to the top. And, um, and then we, we, um, uh, you know, we, we uh, put a, an, um, a perturbation, a weak, very weak perturbation on this flat flame. If we zoom into this region, then this is how it looks like. You see here, this is a very small region, very small amplitude. And then we continue the simulation and, and let this, you know, grow or, or damp out. Uh, and you see here how the, um, how the instability grows. And then we record here the amplitude as function of time. We fit an exponential to this, and then uh, that gives us here omega, the growth rate. Now we can do this simulation for different um, wavelengths, uh, different conditions, and, um, and, and then we get this uh, so-called dispersion relation here, which shows us the growth rate as function of the wavelength. And again, um, we see here, this is the, what we measured. This includes, of course, both the hydrodynamic part and the thermodiffusive part. And you see here the black line, that is just the hydrodynamic part from theory. And, and if we take the difference of these two growth rates, you see this here is now uh, the growth rate that you just get from the thermodiffusive part. And you see that is unstable uh, or destabilizing uh, for a large range of wavelengths here, uh, except for these very small wavelengths. So, um, if, the, if the, the wavelength of the perturbation um, becomes of the same, or the wavelength we consider, becomes of the same order of the, um, the flame thickness, then the diffusive effect is actually uh, stabilizing. So if the wavelength is, is less than roughly uh, three times LF, it becomes stabilizing in this case. Okay, so we can do this now for many different conditions. So we did this for different uh, pressures, or here different equivalence ratios, uh, different uh, temperatures, different pressures. Um, uh, here, this shows you the, the, the uh, in this 3D um, sketch, it shows you the conditions we looked at. We do this then for each one of these conditions and then for different wavelengths, and we get all these dispersion ratios, uh, relations um, that show us how the parameters impact the uh, the instability. And you see here, if we go lean, the instability gets stronger. Uh, if we go to high temperature, the instability gets weaker. If we go to, so this shows a pressure variation at low temperature. This shows a pressure variation at high temperature. And you see that both of these pressure, also uh, high pressure uh, is very destabilizing um, uh, for, the, uh, for the instability. So, uh, well, this is what I just said. Okay, so, so this, was the, um, this was the linear uh, evolution, um, but of course the flame doesn't stay linear. The, the, uh, if the instability, the amplitude grows more and more, then uh, you know, at some point nonlinear effects um, become, uh, become stronger. And you see this here in this experiment, this is a video uh, I got from Dr. Sanchez here uh, from Madrid. Um, they did experiments here in this Healy Shaw cell, uh, which are just two flat plates very close to each other. Uh, there's a, a few layer mixture inside, 
it's um, it's ignited here along this line, and then you get um, here for this uh, lean uh, hydrogen. Or I think actually this is a this is not hydrogen. I think this is actually a rich propane uh, air mixture. The same thing, and you see you know how this becomes stable, you know, and um, uh, how how the nonlinear effects also become important. We wanted to look at this for hydrogen, so we did numerical simulations also here in 2D. Um, you see here, we did these simulations for hydrogen air mixtures. Here, first of all, uh, equivalence ratio of 0.4. Um, there is an inflow here on the bottom, outflow on top. It's on the lateral direction. It's, um, uh, it's periodic. And then... Um, uh, this is this is how the simulation looks like. You see, in the beginning, actually, we we um, you know start out with again with a little perturbation, and you see in the beginning the perturbation grows linearly, meaning everything is still uh, very periodic. Maybe you can see this again when the video starts over. But then after a while, the whole thing uh, starts interacting, um, and it becomes see still periodic now. And then all of a sudden, you get um, uh, you get uh, different effects, and the whole thing becomes chaotic. You see these fingers that burn into the un unburned. You see uh, on the uh, along the edge of these fingers, you see small instabilities occurring. You see these moving around, eating up each other, uh, leading to larger cells, and so on. And one of the reasons we did these simulations was to try to see how large do the um, instability, the large cells here actually grow. If we compare this with an experiment, this is an experiment here again from a Healy Shaw cell. You see that uh, the structures you find the, the, in this case here for hydrogen air, uh, they're very similar to what we see in the simulation. Okay, so um, uh, here, first of all, uh, you see two things. Um, we evaluate now what we call uh, here the consumption speed. The consumption speed is basically the ratio of the mass of fuel burned that you get in this unstable flame compared to the mass of fuel burned that you would get uh, if the flame was not unstable, if it would remain just flat and, and burn with the um, with the laminar burning velocity. And um, you see the, you see the uh, consumption speed here. You see it reaches a value here of about four. So this burns four times faster than the, um, than the um, laminar, um, than, the, than the, 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 the not the, um, what do you call this? The, the flame is not un unstable. As I said, we try to see how large does the, the simulation domain actually have to be in order to you know, be independent of the domain size. Um, and you see the, the uh, horizontal axis here, that's actually the log of the domain size divided by the laminar flame thickness. So it's a non-dimensional domain size. And you see for very small domains here on the left, um, um, you reach a value of three here for the, for the consumption speed, but then it still keeps going up. And only when you have about um, a domain size of about a hundred laminar flame thicknesses, uh, it becomes independent of the domain size. And that actually shows two things. First of all, uh, you, you form these flame fingers uh, that we see here also on the left. They are about, have, a, have a size of approximately 25 laminar flame thicknesses. And you need to have a few of these in the domain to be independent, independent of the um, domain size. So that's, that gives you the value of about 100. And the second thing it shows is that um, if we get even larger, these fingers, they don't grow um, anymore, uh, which shows also that the instability cells do not grow beyond all limits. So then we looked at the smaller scale, um, uh, smaller scale uh, length scales uh, of the cellular structure. For that, we move along here the, um, the edge, uh, or, or let's say an isosurface, uh, we record the curvature here along this isosurface. We look at the distance along this line, uh, the distance um, uh, or, or the arc length uh, between two peaks of curvature. Uh, and, and then we do a, we uh, evaluate a PDF of this and, and this is what, what it shows. Uh, and you see here, you get a, a maximum at about, um, let's say six flame thicknesses uh, and that roughly co coincides with the uh, maximum growth rate 
uh, that we saw earlier in the dispersion relation. And that is very interesting. Um, it seems trivial, but it's very interesting that um, it shows that the cell size is a result of the nonlinear interactions that you get. But these, correl these are the same, actually, uh, the length scale is the same as what you saw as the as a maximum growth rate in the linear regime. So the linear growth actually is, is very important here. That's, uh, that's an important fact. Okay, now this was one case, um, one condition. We can do this now for many different conditions. Uh, here, this shows a variation in, in equivalence ratio here in the first row, um, a variation in the temperature in the second row, a variation in pressure uh, at low temperature, variation in pressure at high temperature. Again, you know, this is shown here. And uh, so we have all this data and we can analyze the data. And there, there are different things um, we can see. First of all, um, we can look here at the joint PDFs, um, let's say here of the of the um, uh, of the growth rate uh, and the um, and the um, uh, progress variable, and, and what you see uh, is first of all the progress variable is here hydrogen uh, is here uh, water. You see that um, this would be the equilibrium value here is one. Uh, you see that you get large probabilities to get values that are larger actually than the equilibrium value. Uh, so overshoots in temperature and also in in hydrogen. Uh, the second thing you see is that you get a lot of variation here, um, whereas a case here, 700 Kelvin, is a case shown here where you, where you don't get um, a lot of instability. Um, when you compare here this, the conditional mean of the, grow, of the uh, chemical source term, which is shown in red, compared with an unstretched flamelet, uh, which is in black, you see this has pretty much unstretched flamelet-like behavior. But if you look here on the left, um, uh, you see that it's bimodal. You get one region here that is uh, burning strongly, and you get another region that is here uh, virtually uh, extinguished, which which is these um, regions here uh, in in the wake of these um, uh, of these high curvature regions. Um, so so um, you know this does not behave like an like an unstretched uh, flamelet. If you look at this more quantitatively, um, again here what you see is uh, here in the in the blue lines. Let's first just look at the blue lines. The blue lines are again the consumption speed. And, again, and here we have the uh, equivalence ratio variation, uh, here uh, temperature, and then the two pressure variations. And you see you get um, here consumption speed increases here of up to a factor of four or here for the, for the pressure, uh, in for high pressures of, of five or six. And um, you see that higher equivalence ratio uh, gives you less of this in, in the in, in the nonlinear regime. Um, again, high temperature uh, also leads to less um, uh, instability. Um, high pressures lead to more instability and higher consumption rate. Okay, and then uh, the other thing you can see here is that um, if if we now ask the question, what causes this increase? Uh, we can split up this consumption speed in a, a part that's related to an increase in the flame surface and an increase in the local uh, flame displacement speed, uh, I not the so-called stretch factor. And then we see that here, um, here for many of these cases, uh, both actually increase. Um, however, we see here that, for example, for the pressure change, the, um, uh, the, the flame surface is not increased. It is only the, the stretch factor that's increased. And the, the other thing here is for the high equivalence ratio, you see the opposite. Um, you, you get an increase in, in um, flame surface, but the I naught uh, here is basically uh, equal to one. The, another fact that's quite interesting, um, again, here the comparison with the linear theory is this shows the correlation of the flame um, displacement of the consumption speed with the um, uh, with the growth rate of the, in the linear regime, and you see very good correlation, and and um, it almost seems uh, trivial, but again, uh, this compares the nonlinear the nonlinear evolution uh, to the to the linear um, uh, regime, and it's very good correlation. I mean, you see, it's not a linear relation, but um, it's a correlation uh, which is important, and it might be interesting also uh, for modeling. So again. 
we can, um, we can, because we have done all these different cases, we can fit these, um, or we can provide a fit for this. So this consumption speed here in a power law as function of uh, these parameters. Um, this is the regression uh, uh, plot here of this fit. The fit is actually quite good. And then we can also look at uh, this here in this 2D plot. This is the unburned temperature, this equivalence ratio uh, here for one bar. And, and the color here shows you uh, how much faster this burns than, the, the, than if you had no instability. And you see here, for example, one bar that would be uh, this household burner I talked about earlier. Typical operating uh, range here would be um, equivalence ratio of 0.4 uh, um, with a little preheating here. And you would get to a flame speed or consumption speed which is two or three times higher uh, or even even higher than uh, than if there was no instability uh, in in a combustion engine internal combustion engine let's say here at 20 bar isentropic compression internal combustion engine all gas turbine would be about uh, 700 kelvin uh, and and again if you're here at 0.4 you see you get a factor of two or three maybe higher than than uh, what you would have without the uh, instability so these instabilities they are important uh, you know, for burner or even engine conditions. Okay, then let's look at the um, let's look at the uh, the uh, turbulent um, combustion. This uh, is an example here. I want to start with. This is the low swirl burner from Robert Cheng. I had the pleasure uh, many years ago to see this uh, even for hydrogen in his lab. Um, you see here these, this OH cliff here for the, for the methane flame, OH cliff here for the hydrogen flame. And again, you see a lot more corrugation. You, you seem to see these long fingers here, uh, indication for, for the instability. But, but, but uh, the question then is how does the turbulence interact with the instabilities? This is another example um, from our lab. This is an experiment that we have done uh, some years ago, this is a, a turbulent slot burner um, where we have a fuel air uh, mixture coming out of this uh, fuel slot. We have a, um, a pilot around this slot. Uh, the pilot, so this was actually the, the, um, uh, the slot burner was designed so that it's a homogeneous, has a homogeneous velocity field along the slot. Um, this is shown here. This is from PIV measurements. You see here velocity profiles along along this uh, slot length. And you see that the maximum velocity here uh, is, is pretty much homogeneous. That's important. I'll come back uh, to this in a minute. Uh, then we use here the, the PIV uh, droplets uh, that burn out in the flame uh, to, to, um, as a flame marker. Uh, this is a binarized image. Uh, we then, uh, from this, uh, we um, uh, obtain a mean uh, a turbulent burning velocity and that turbulent burning velocity that uh, is then shown here. So, so this shows the turbulent burning velocity for two different cases, a richer case here 0.8 and leaner case for pure methane. And then we, and then here on the, on the horizontal axis, uh, we add hydrogen to methane here up to 60%. And you see when you add hydrogen to methane, then the flame speed goes up and that's not a big surprise. But what's interesting is that if we um, look at the uh, ST by, by SL, because SL also goes up when you add hydrogen, uh, you see here that for the richer case, um, that ratio actually doesn't change very much, which is something you might expect in the, um, in the, uh, um, uh, which you might expect. And then um, uh, if you look at the leaner case, then you see that that ratio goes up, the turbulent flame speed goes up. And that might be because of the, um, the onset of instabilities. So in order to study this a little better with the DNS, and again, um, I come back to this, why did we design this to be, um, to be homogeneous in this direction? Because if it is, then we can assume it's periodic in, in the slot direction. And we, we can do these uh, DNS simulations that we often do, where we assume this is periodic um, in this direction. Uh, so this, uh, this is according to this validation pyramid. We take a lab scale experiment, we try to do DNS to then understand better what happens. And um, this, um, so this is um, some specifics of the DNS we did. Um, so you see here, we have a, a hydrogen air mixture that comes through the slot in the domain. 
we have a broad pilot around this. Uh, the equivalence ratio of 0.4, and otherwise uh, is atmospheric conditions. Uh, Reynolds number here in the slot is about 11,000. Karlovitz number is 16. So these conditions, they would have, we just saw in the for the laminar flame, the instability, uh, would have a, a surface um, ratio, uh, uh, which is a factor of two. I not was a factor of two, and all in all, that gave us for the laminar flame, that gave us an increase of um, the uh, consumption speed of a factor of four. And now one could think, well, uh, you know, for the turbulent flame, maybe the turbulent flame, the turbulence is much stronger than the instability and you don't even see what the, what the instability does. But you see already, if you look at these two cases, we have one case, uh, you know, which is the real hydrogen case with non-unity Lewis number. Then we have one here with unity Lewis number. Uh, and you see already they're, they're very, very different. So we look at this a little more quantitatively. The first thing you see is that the flame length here of the non-unity Lewis number case is much shorter, which means the consumption speed is much higher. The second thing is uh, you see here, again, if you look at, the, at the, the progress variable, you see you get strong overshoots here in the progress variable, which means again, which comes from these instabilities. Uh, the third is um, the consumption rate is much higher. Here, again, we look at the consumption rate um, uh, as function of distance from the nozzle. And you see here, it reaches values of about 15 um, uh, compared to the laminar flame speed. Uh, here, the unit to lose number case is about five. And then again, we can see, try to see what causes this. The orange line here is the flame surface um, area uh, ratio. Um, which here in the um, unity Lewis number case is about four. I nod in the unit, unity Lewis number case is one. And you see also here in the non unity Lewis number case, the, the, the area, the flame area is roughly the same as, as for the unity Lewis number, but the I not now is much larger. I not here is about five. Uh, and remember for the laminar case, it was equal to two. So the interaction of the, uh, the, the, um, the instability for the laminar case leads to a high I naught, but for the turbulent case, the interaction of the instability with the turbulence leads to a local flame speed, flame displacement speed, which is even much, much higher, two and a half times higher. So then uh, if we look again here, this is what we did earlier also for the laminar case. If we look at the, um, the um, uh, consumption at the, the, the chemical source term as function of the, uh, or the joint statistics, let's say, of the chemical source term and the progress variable, you see again um, for the unity Lewis number case, it almost behaves like an unstretched flamelet, uh, but for the non-unity Lewis number case, there's a, there's a lot of variation. Here. And then the question is, why is the um, I not, why is it so large? Why is the local uh, flame speed so large? Um, we can see this here uh, in this plot. This here shows the joint probability of, of mixture of local mixture fraction and progress variable. And here for the laminar flame, uh, we saw earlier that um, you get regions where, where the temperature and the progress variable are larger than one. These are the regions that are very rich, where actually uh, locally you have rich mixture. And you see here in the turbulent flame, this is even much stronger. Why is that? Because of two reasons. The first is that um, you see this here on the right, we measure the local flame thickness. This here is the local flame thickness in the laminar case. This here is the flame thickness in the turbulent case. And you see in the turbulent case, uh, because of the high stretch, the flame local flame thickness becomes even larger, which of course um, makes the um, instability effect stronger. And then also locally, uh, we expect here to see, we haven't analyzed this um, uh, all the way, but we expect to see um, higher curvatures because of the in interaction of the um, tangential strain with uh, the unstable flame, and that also um, should increase the instability effects. So that um, that's then leads to a higher uh, reactivity. Then, um, um, so, so that was um, about the DNS. And then the next question could be, and, and this will be my last topic. The next question uh, could be, um, what about modeling? Can we model all of this? And people have um, provided models to look at these differential diffusion effects. Um, uh, there's probably a lot of work in the literature. I only uh, showed two examples or mentioned two examples here uh, from um, collaborations here we had with different people. 
um, one we had with Rob Bastian's long time ago, and I think even before that, he suggested uh, to use um, to use two porous variables. Um, you know, the hydrogen mass fraction and the temperature, and then uh, we continued uh, working on this approach together with my um, former student, um, uh, Guillaume Blancard, when he was still in my group, and then he later continued this with uh, his student here, Jonathan Regler. And, um, uh, you know, um, and one, one of um, the ways here to derive this mixture fraction is to assume one step global reaction and then assume a coupling function, combine these two progress variables that gives you then a, uh, an equation here for, the, for a mixed local mixture fraction, which has a source term that just comes here from these non-unity Lewis number effects. And um, so if we um, then, um, use different flamelets and tabulate for different um, uh, equivalence ratio and tabulate this um, using these um, uh, two progress variables here or this progress variable and mixture fraction, then actually we can reproduce uh, an unstable flame. So this shows reduced order manifolds with at least two uh, variables, they can reproduce these um, unstable flames. But then the question is, what happens if the instability occurs on the subgrid scale? Uh, you know, or if you talk about RANS, then you have to model all of these um, different very complex aspects. And um, so here I'm showing an example uh, from a collaboration with a group of Francesco Creta in, um, in Rome and his group, uh, who, who suggested to use data-driven models where you do a simulation of a, um, you know, small simulation 2D of an, of an instability, and then you um, filter this and, and then uh, tabulate the filtered values. And um, the question then is how large does the, again, how large does your box have to be uh, that you need to do to um, get the data for your data-driven model? And so um, what was done here was to compute an instability on a small box, larger box, and then use these to model what happens in an even larger box. And this here shows the filtered reaction term from these different approaches the large box is the, is the dashed line here. Um, the blue line is, is using just one progress variable, uh, which you see is not very good. Um, the small box here, TD1, that is the orange is also not very good. But if you use this, um, the TD2 here, the yellow line, that's actually in pretty good agreement with, with what you want to see. Um, and, and why is that? Um, the, the, this box size is roughly the box size of this finger. And so it turns out a necessary and, and also sufficient condition uh, seems to be that you need to have one finger in your box and then you capture all the physics uh, you need. That's also an interesting uh, statement by itself. So then let me summarize very quickly. Um, we looked at um, hydrogen. Um, I mentioned it has many different um, features that are different from hydrocarbons. These instabilities are very important. Uh, they are important for laminar flames, lead to very large um, increase in, in, in local flame, in, in flame consumption, uh, which is also important for turbulent flames. Uh, the instabilities significantly affect dynamics of the flames, both for laminar and for uh, turbulent flames. And the main take home message here uh, is that hydrogen flames are not as simple as it uh, might sometimes see. I want to uh, make a little advertisement here. We have this new journal edited by uh, Fei Shi and myself, Application in Energy and Combustion Science is an Elsevier journal that um, you know, tries to look at fundamental science, but with relevance uh, to applications. Um, it's an open access journal. Um, support this journal by submitting your very high quality work uh, to this journal. And then finally, uh, this is a list of some of the references. I want to thank the external collaborators here, Rob Bastians, uh, Marshall Matalan, uh, Francesco Creta and his team, uh, and again, all the people from our own group for uh, the contributions. And thanks also to um, uh, some of the sponsors of this work. So with this, I'll stop. And if there's time, I'm happy to take any questions. So Professor Pitch, thank you for the very nice talk. And uh, uh, we received uh, several questions and uh, I will ask them. Uh, so the first question is from Ahmed Avano. What are the most influential means in achieving stable and controllable combustion under engine-like conditions? I guess the question is related to the hydrogen combustion and given the high flame propagation speed, the energy necessary uh, to cause hydrogen combustion, 
is much smaller than that required for other traditional fuels. I, I'm not exactly sure what the question refers to, but um, so engine-like conditions means uh, probably high pressure and high temperature conditions. Uh, what's interesting again is that these um, that the instability go. So if you have in an internal combustion engine or gas turbine, you have something as close to maybe an um, um, uh, isentropic compression, uh, which increases temperature and pressure. Uh, the pressure increase, it makes the instability stronger. The temperature increase makes it weaker, but then uh, it both compensate to some degree, but we saw that it's still there. Um, at high, in a gas turbine, you have to be concerned with flashback, um, uh, maybe not so much with the surface ignition effects. In um, the surface burners I showed earlier, you have to be really concerned with these um, surface ignition effects when you when the maybe when the, the burner starts glowing, which, which as I said is sometimes a desired feature, and for internal combustion engine piston engine, um, it's quite interesting that you can actually for hydrogen has high run, so you can increase the equivalence ratio, but uh, you can increase the um, uh, the compression ratio and get very high stability. You can increase compression ratio. You can go very lean, and you can go and you get high flame speeds. This all gives you super high, all three by, by themselves give you high uh, efficiency in an engine. So that's very good. But the, but the point is you might have to boost the engine uh, to get power and that might lead to um, surface ignition. And how to prevent this? Uh, I don't know yet. Uh, we have a new project uh, um, uh, in collaboration with, with our colleagues here, Stefan Pischinger, from the internal combustion engine lab, um, where we will uh, try to look at this. I hope. Okay, thanks. Yep. So the next question is uh, from Yenqing Li: uh, Whether the flame front has a character of a fractal? I guess the question, if I remember correctly, the question is related to the uh, planar flame. Yeah, so, um, so I mean, it's related probably to what we see here. And um, of course, you can always define a fractal dimension and the fractal dimension. And this has a, a, a fractal dimension here that is, um, uh, that is larger than one, I mean, in this, in this 2D plot. Uh, that's for sure. But I think fractal, um, fractal here means also that you have these larger scales and they form smaller scales and yet smaller scales. You don't see that much of a range of different scales here. And most of all, you see here, you get this um, larger scale um, with typically here with a small kink here in, in the center. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure if you get a large fractal range, but, but it has, I mean, you can evaluate the fractal dimension, which is larger than one then here in this case. Um, the next question is not really related to the hydrogen combustion, but I guess it's also a very interesting question. Uh, one of the challenges for hydrogen adoption is storage. A potential solution for this is the use of, of ammonia as a hydrogen carrier. Ammonia has some substantial challenges as a combustion fuel. Uh, I wonder whether you could uh, comment on the potential for ammonia as a hydrogen carrier. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a, of course a very good question and um, it's difficult to look in the future. But, uh, you know, as I mentioned, it is difficult to store hydrogen. Um, and especially if you go, um, if you want to carry the energy over or transport the energy over long distances, maybe, maybe here in Germany, we, we hope to get uh, energy from, from uh, North Africa, for example, or maybe from Australia then maybe um, ammonia is even better. The nice thing about um, hydrogen is much easier to convert it back to, let's say, electricity or, or usable power uh, directly. That is more difficult for, uh, for uh, ammonia. Uh, of course, there are, there are efforts to burn ammonia, uh, which is which is not as also has a lot of challenges because in that case uh, because of low flame speeds and because of uh, of course high NOx emissions but but some people have been successfully um, showing how to do this um, so there will be a competition one thing that is interesting is that 
uh, advantage of, uh, one thing is interesting, you could actually mix both together. It was not good for storage, but uh, it, it might compensate the uh, challenges you have with both. And the other thing that's, um, that's interesting about hydrogen is much easier to mix it um, into other things. So for example, hydrogen can be mixed into the natural gas grid and distributed uh, without extra effort up to, uh, you know, people say, um, I think 10% or maybe a little more. But um, one has to keep in mind that 10% by volume uh, is only 3% by energy. So it's not very much either, but it might be easier also to distribute it um, and, and have, have a, a wider use. Whereas for ammonia, the transport, of course, uh, is much easier. Okay, the next question is, why does the laminar flame surface density sigma decrease when the pressure goes up at both low and high temperatures? The question is related to the content on page 13. 13, um, Yeah, 30. Um, so um, let's see, why does the laminar flame decrease when the pressure goes up? Um, it doesn't decrease really. Um, what it does is it, um, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't decrease, it almost stays the same. It, it goes down a little bit. I don't know why it goes down a little bit. Um, maybe we can look at this here. Um, I mean, actually it looks like it goes up, um, but I have to say when we, when we evaluate these things, one has to keep in mind that is very the behavior of this depends very strongly on the definition of the progress variable first of all, and then secondly also of the level. Here we look at one um, isosurface, and if you would look at a different isosurface, you would get um, slightly different results. For example, even if you look at this, even if you look at this, if you look if you take the green here, uh, for example, as the isosurface, it looks like um, the, the surface goes up, but obviously the isosurface we use, it goes down. So I wouldn't put too much, um, too, I wouldn't put too much um, meaning into these small differences, maybe more in the large differences. And at, at the end of the day, only the combination of I not and, um, and the sigma together are meaningful because that is the actual uh, burning rate of the fuel. I hope that that answers the question. Okay, thanks. Let's move to the next question. The flame instability and the resulting cellular structure, uh, you mainly alluded to preferentially uh, uh, diffusion of hydrogen and oxygen. Can you also comment on the effect of lighter species? For example, edge radical in this case. Yeah, hydrogen radical, of course, has, has even a smaller uh, Lewis number. The Lewis number, typically, if you evaluate it in the flames of, of H2 is 0.3, roughly, of the hydrogen radicals, 0.17. So it's, it's even much smaller. But because the hydrogen radical lives in a smaller region, the, the, the effect is, is not as important as for hydrogen. Which, which is transported over larger distances and, and also because of the competition with the oxygen, uh, it makes a bigger effect. Um, I couldn't tell you now what would happen if, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if we have done this, uh, if you, oh, I think we have done this actually, but I, I don't know the quantitatively the results, but if you would set all Lewis numbers equal to one, except for uh, uh, H2, and I think you would get almost the same results. Maybe the, the, the burning velocity is, is slightly different, but quant qualitatively you would get almost the same results. And the next the question is, how would the substantial effects of hydrodynamic and diffusional thermal instability change the turbulent combustion region diagram? Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question because many years ago, we tried to come up uh, with a regime diagram that also uh, includes the, um, the instability. Uh, this was together with um, uh, Satoshi Kadowaki from Japan. 
And um, unfortunately, uh, we never got this published really, even though it was interesting. And other people also have tried to come up with a regime diagram. Um, what was wrong at the time, I think, is that we looked at the growth rates um, based on simulations in very small domains. And I showed you in this lecture that you actually need very large domains to, to capture the, um, the effect. So um, we have thought about um, uh, revising this. And there are two, two um, topics that are uh, important. The first topic that's important is the actual amplitude, uh, the, um, um, uh, the amplitude that you get compared to the amplitude that you would get from, uh, from turbulence um, of, of flame front corrugations, let's say. And the second is the growth rate that you get from the instability in flame surface compared with the growth rate you get from the, um, from the, um, uh, from the turbulence in, in the flame surface. Now, when we did this many, many years ago, we only thought about this, but what I showed here was that also I not uh, the, the stretch factor. Actually, the stretch factor in this context is a little wrong. Uh, we should revise this because it's not only the effect of stretch, it also, I mean, the stretch cause, causes this demixing where you get locally rich and, 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 and lean regions. And this I not also um, uh, has to, here has to describe um, this change in the local equivalence ratio. But anyways, um, that also needs to be considered and we hadn't done this uh, in the past. So that's something uh, we should think about again. Uh, but, but there are certainly regions, regimes, I think, where the, where the turbulence is so strong that the instability might not matter very much. Uh, but what we have seen now is that for a reasonably uh, strong turbulence uh, and, and reasonable Karlovitz numbers that we showed here, uh, definitely, it has a very strong impact. And the next question is from the, also from Professor Zhao. It's about how to control NOx for hydrogen combustion. Yeah, that, I think that question is too broad. I showed you earlier uh, one where we actually saw that with this, with this uh, flat plate burner, this perforated burner, uh, increasing the, um, the, um, the fraction of hydrogen led to higher burning velocity, which leads to higher heat losses to the burner, which leads to lower combustion temperatures and less NOx. So um, um, I think one of the issues is that, um, that I think if you have pure hydrogen combustion, then it should actually be possible to, um, uh, I mean, again, the, the question is too broad because this depends really on, on what, what device you're looking at. So if you look at a gas turbine, I think you can burn lean enough that, that you don't have much uh, NOx emissions. If you talk about um, internal combustion engine at low load, also you can go uh, ultra lean. At high load though, you need to go close to stoichiometric and then, um, and then uh, NOx is an issue. Um, that, that, and then also there are no real heat losses there. So uh, then again, I think, um, yeah, that's, that's more difficult. Um, but um, it, it really, I think it really depends on the device you're looking at. So the next question is from Professor Baikas. Uh, very interesting findings. I have learned the new things today. In case we intended to use hydrogen as fuel in the mobility sector, especially in internal combustion engine applications, one of the implications of your research will be the challenge of exactly controlling lambda in rear engine operation, especially on a cycle by cycle base in strong transient uh, driving cycles. Rear drive emissions uh, monitoring will require very lean engine operation for lower NOx. This will help decide the impact on turbocharging for acceptable engine power out. Also a huge influence on the engine operation due to instabilities. Purely from the rear application perspective, how do you access hydrogen potential as a combustion fuel in internal combustion engines? Yeah, I mean, first of all, um, it's, it's Bikas uh, and Professor Bikas is your academic uncle. So you better be nice to him and learn how to pronounce his name. Um, but uh, anyways, I mean, this goes back to uh, what I was just discussing. I, to me personally, I think hydrogen for internal combustion engines is very, very exciting. 
uh, for, for all the reasons you mentioned here, but there are challenges because um, unlike other applications, internal combustion engines, they need to be um, dynamic, uh, operated in a dynamic mode and very flexible, high load, low load. And um, these different regimes have different Opp again, opportunities and, and challenges. Again, low load, one could go ultra lean, uh, which, which is really interesting. Uh, high load, um, I don't know. I mean, that's then the challenge. Mixing is a real issue. Um, so I, for me personally, I think the, the issue is not in the combustion process. The issue is in um, storing the hydrogen in the car, uh, even under high pressure, um, I mentioned earlier, high pressure seems like has high energy density, but um, of course, high pressure tank system is very heavy, which makes it lower. Um, I, I didn't discuss this. And then secondly, also uh, producing hydrogen. One might not have enough hydrogen. I, as I said earlier, I don't think there will be a pure hydrogen economy or pure ammonia economy or a pure, uh, you know, OME, other e-fuel economy. I think there will be, um, hopefully, a mix of, of, of different uh, products uh, that we use in different devices for different, um, for different um, scenarios because, um, you know, I mean, each, each application might have um, a different... Uh, ideal solution. And I think uh, politics today doesn't really consider this. Politics just thinks, likes to think in, in one, one direction rather than, uh, um, you know, many, many different directions at the same time. But I think that's what the, what the solution will be. And, and maybe we won't have enough hydrogen uh, because it is also difficult to carry this over long distances. And hydrogen might be used, might be more suitable to be used in, in other areas. But uh, uh, we we uh, have an inter we have a single cylinder engine in our lab, and we run it with hydrogen. We want to look at this and and see how good it is. I think it will be really good. But uh, let me just one say one more thing. Methanol is another fuel that could be a, could be um, an e fuel with carbon capture directly from the air and um, which has uh, really, really good combustion properties in internal combustion engines. It's, it's nicely storable. So maybe that's, that, is, that could be, would be the competition. Okay. I hope this answers your question, Anko Bikas. And now let's move to the next question. So the flame speed for lean hydrogen air flames are enhanced when positively stretched. Are there turbulent conversing scenarios where negative stretch begins to dominate, thereby enhancing the Lewis number effects of hydrogen? Also, shouldn't we use two Mark Stein numbers? Absolutely. I mean, the last question, absolutely. There should be two Mark Stein numbers. The only reason why I used only one is because I considered spherical flames and in spherical flames, um, uh, both effects are linked and, and it can be expressed by, at least in this uh, simple way I looked at it uh, by one, but absolutely one should use one Markstein number for uh, strain and one for curvature. Um, I, I should say here, it, it's not just a positive stretch. I mean, for these spherical flames, you have positive uh, stretch, but um, in, in turbulence, of course, you have everything. And um, what we see uh, actually, when you look at an, a flame kernel in internal combustion engines, um, uh, we see that, uh, or, or let's say look at turbulence in general. I mean, you, you get both positive and, curve and negative stretch, and, and both are important. And um, again, the positive stretch just leads to things burning faster. The negative stretch leads to uh, things burning more slowly. And, and the interaction of both actually is what, what makes this um, uh, complicated. Um, I don't know where you get negative stretch, but uh, the, the scenarios you do get um, is, that is something I, I skipped here actually. I had a slide to just show this uh, effect. Uh, it's shown here. Um, you, could, you could go to high Lewis number um, where you get, uh, for example, if you look at uh, this year's iso-octane combustion uh, in turbulent flow, 
where the uh, uh, the Maxwell number is positive, but uh, you so you get the opposite effect, where a positive curvature actually makes things slower. And you see here, this is the this is the burning rate for for um, the real fuel, and this is the burning rate for um, the fuel where the Lewis number is assumed to be one, which burns much much faster. And now, if you think of hydrogen, where the Lewis number is is so this is Lewis number two, Lewis number one, and Lewis number 0.3, that would be here. So it would burn much, much faster, uh, you know, in this early flame kernel development, which is very important, uh, which is very important for, for lean burn in engines, but, but also it's very important for safety. I mean, any small spark that starts, starts as a small kernel and, and hydrogen just, um, you know, uh, burns much faster when it's very small. Yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe there are uh, unenhancing for hydrogen, but uh, maybe I don't know any. So I guess today we are really run out of time, and just let me ask the last question for today. And I guess it's also quite an interesting question. Uh, can you please outline the challenges in conversing of hydrogen in a hydrogen water air mixture? For example, combusting of unutilized fuel from a fuser exhaust. Yeah, that's uh, that's a very interesting question. I think um, I think so. This is also interesting because in internal combustion engines, uh, you might want to do uh, EGR, exhaust gas recirculation. Also, maybe just to dilute and uh, bring NOx down. Um, which you can do now because you, I mean, typically in a diesel engine that would lead to soot emissions, but for hydrogen it doesn't. Um, so um, uh, yeah, anytime you have EGR, you bring back the uh, the, the water uh, steam, and I think actually that it will have mostly uh, just a dilution effect, that it will not have strong chemical interaction. We looked in the past um, at um, scenarios where you would inject water into an internal combustion engine to prevent knock at high, uh, at high load and try to see if that water actually also uh, impacts the, the chemistry in any way that leads to ignition. And we saw that it, it didn't really um, do that. Uh, so, so maybe it's not so. Maybe it's not uh, very difficult from from that point of view. Um, but of course, it it would contribute to this uh, demixing that that you get between then hydrogen and water also. We are really run out of time, and still there are a lot of interesting questions that uh, we don't have time to answer in this talk. And this is really unusual, I must say, Professor Pitch. And it seems that your talk is very interesting for all the people from our community. So thanks, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I, I want to say I'm I'm uh, happy to contribute. I bet uh, I mean I know uh, there are many many uh, interesting talks in this lecture series. Thanks for uh, running this to all the um, to all the organizers. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, you know on a on a Saturday, uh, which might be a holiday here for most people. <laughs>